various um, mediums um, that um, people are increasingly looking at each other and pointing the finger at each other and looking at what this person's doing, what that person's doing. But I think that when you look at the righteous and holy standard, and when you look at God himself, and when that becomes your focus, um, all these other things start to become, you know, we're so much closer to each other in imperfection, even on your, your favorite Christian to pick on's worst day, and compare it to comparison to God, that really we're arguing over decimal points, right? You know, at one point, it's like you're arguing over change, right? When you realize how great God is and how perfect he is and how far away we are from that, the minute differences that exist between us are just like um, hundreds of places, thousands of places right. on the dust point. So the arguments become really, really fickle. So God's probably like, if only you knew how unholy you were, <laughs> you don't have faith for time. It's like, really, all of you are just like, <laughs> But thank God for Jesus. Right, and so he, we, we were, were able to um, receive um, to our account the righteousness of God. And I think that it's important for us, although we just didn't laugh about it in terms of comparative righteousness, it's important for us to remember um, that his righteousness goes so far beyond anything we could have achieved or attained on our own um, that it's not even worth bringing up or even mentioning how good we think we are. I'm always amazed at people that become deeply spiritual Right, and we become deeply spiritual, we become like so wonderful and so great. It's like, yeah, the more wonderful you are, the more likely it is that you probably have not really had a strong encounter with God. When you really encounter God, I think that many of us have all had that experience like, oh my gosh, uh, what is that? That is not me. <laughs> that is so far beyond me. <coughs> Please don't kill me. <laughs> it's like, wow, he is just so awesomely amazing. I do want to continue. Um, in the book of Romans, been looking at that Romans chapter 12. Um, perhaps many of you remember that that's kind of where we had left off previously. Um, and, and I think that there's an important lesson for us to continue to learn there. In the previous uh, messages, or message, we have been talking about this whole notion um, of being transformed, right? But there was something else that came up, and that was that whole notion um, of habits and things of that nature. And so it's not merely um, that I need God to change my heart, but there are patterns in my mind um, that consistently try to rob me of the gracious liberty that is in Christ. It's funny, I'm free, but my habit tells me to stay bound. I, I'm used to bondage, right? So let's pray for a couple of moments. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you. Um, this is your word that we're declaring to your people. I know that your word is alive. I know that it's powerful. I know that it's sharper than any two-edged sword. It can sanctify us. The words that you speak to us, they are spirit and they are life. And we are sanctified by the words that you speak to us. So, Father, we pray, God, that you will continue to conform us to the image of your dear son, that you will continue to help us to crucify those things within us that need to die and to embrace the new life that you have placed within us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen, amen. amen. You remember this text, I beseech you, therefore, brought by the mercies of God. Present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world, be transformed by the renewing of your mind, is what we've been talking about. We've been talking about this whole notion, again, of, of habits and things that um, really um, seek to um, rob us of the joyous liberty that's in him. One of the things, if there's anything, and, and I've said this a couple times um, during this, this particular um, period in which we've been living for the past week, um, is the notes or the difference between hunger and habit, um, between um, eating because um, you're hunger, eating because you like the taste. It's like, oh, I really want to eat that. You know, it's like a taste for cravings is the word for that, right? Cravings. Um, cravings and habits, etc. And so it's possible that you can actually not have the hunger, but still have the craving. And I think it's difficult sometimes for us to actually narrow the difference between the two. And so you can be craving. See, when you're hungry, you're just hungry. When you're craving something, like, there's something particular, like you have the craving for it. Or even the habit. I told you the last time that we were together, um, before we had gone through this particular experience, about um, how boredom can sometimes lead you to the pantry, at least lead me to the pantry. So you're bored. And so it's not that you're hungry. It's just called, hmm, what am I going to do? As you just go look at the cabinet, it's like, oh, is there anything here to eat, right? There's something that I can eat so I can find to. 
And, and, and while that example of eating is certainly one that works particularly this week, I think that if we really look introspectively within ourselves, in terms of our own habits, our own patterns, the traps that we fall into, sometimes they align with things like boredom, sometimes they align to things like habits, sometimes they align to things like cravings. And glory to God and praises to his name that oftentimes God removes from us the hunger. But who knew that moving the hunger was not enough? <laughs> God, if you would deliver me from this, it's like, all right, hunger gone. It's like, but why do I still have this craving? Why do I still have this habit? Why do I still have... See, when I'm hungry, the, 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 the message to my mind is, I'm going to die if I don't eat. But when I'm craving, the message is not a matter of life and death. Right? It's, not, it's not that I'm not going to die if I don't eat. I just might not be as happy as I could be if I don't eat. It becomes a message of pleasure versus necessity. Right? And so God oftentimes delivers us from, because once upon a time, there are things that we used to do, and we did them because we felt the necessity to do them. Right? We know what hunger is in the spirit realm. It's like, uh, you know, and when we get saved, God begins to change our hunger. Thank God. He begins to change our appetites. Thank God. But then, I don't know why your God does this. Oftentimes, he leaves to us to manage our habits and our cravings. Does that make sense to anybody? Mm -hmm. Right? It's like, now this is the job that you're going to do. It's like, well, I don't want to do that job. <laughs> <laughs> and so he gives you this responsibility, right? He's like, um, be not conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And somehow this being transformed or renewing of I have to open myself up to that. I have to yield my mind, allow my mind to be transformed. I've got to be willing to let God make me, allow me to think differently. I've got to embrace new thought patterns. All right, and part of this for me has been that whole embracing not only new foods, Right, because you get bored eating the same thing. Right, because first I said, I don't know what I'm going to do. I got this. I'm going to drink that master cleanse every day. And then all of a sudden, just like all you church people, all of a sudden that got boring real quick. <laughs> if I don't get that master cleanse, I'm a backslide. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not how we all approach, so listen, to how we approach our sinful inclinations. We get real, real strict with it. It's like, I'm not going to watch TV at all. I'm going to we get like extra, actually go to the extreme. And then our extremes often fail us, then we go buck all crazy, right? <laughs> so we have to learn how to properly balance and manage it. I hope this makes sense to somebody, right? And so what ends up happening is that we go from this extreme, and it doesn't matter what the extreme is, depending on what our, our situation is, we go, we swim the pendulum, pendulum all the way to this direction. And then we find out that, mm, that wasn't very realistic, was it? <laughs> it sounds so easy in theory, though. Sounds so easy in theory. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to do it. I'm going to be extra saved. I'm going to be extra this. I'm going to be extra that. And you find out that extra saving, extra nothing, it doesn't even exist. I mean, we found that message to be the truth. Right? You wake up one day, you're like, I'm going to be extra this day. It's like all you become is extra. And it ain't saved. You're just extra. <laughs> <laughs> you get on your nerves, your friend's nerves, and your own nerves. It's like, oh my gosh. What's wrong with you? You're just so extra. Like, can't you tell I'm saved today? Like, mm, I wish you weren't. <laughs> right? And then our attitudes and our deportments change because we're not being authentic right, to Christian experience. Right? We have idolized the perfection. We have idolized religiosity. And it's like God doesn't let us get away with that. And so either we learn how to balance or God allows us to swing in the other direction. We're like, oh my gosh, what happened to me? And then we somehow find our way back towards the middle, right? And so then, as I went through my journey, um, we start trying to find, well, what else can I eat? I'm not going to just do this master cleanse and that's it. What else am I going to do? Uh, what, what, new, uh, what new foods can I begin to embrace? 
And maybe this goes beyond just not eating certain foods. Maybe this is actually a lifestyle change. Right. Maybe this stuff was never good for me in the first place. Right? Maybe some of these things were actually bad. Right? Can you imagine? That's actually bad. Maybe some of this stuff had no nutritional value for me at all. Some stuff, maybe I didn't eat so that, you know, I'm praying like, Lord, bless for nourishment. But I never had nourishment in the first place. <laughs> I'm asking God to bless the poison I'm about to put in my mouth. <laughs> Lord, bless this poison I'm about to eat. I know it will give me diabetes, hypertension, obesity, and everything else. But God bless it. I know you'll sanctify it in Jesus' name. <laughs> And again, we use, uh, this day of all days, we can all, uh, we can all respond to food analogies, but I hope that you will not, um, based on the illustration, limit it to food, but recognize how big this is, that oftentimes what we're trying to do is give God a particular list of things that we don't want to do anymore because we've realized, oh, I shouldn't be doing that, but sometimes the bigger lesson is in the lifestyle change. So maybe it's not just about not eating this. Maybe it's about there's a whole big thing around this. that God, And I've just been focused on this little thing, but God's focused on this much, much bigger picture. And so it's like, I'm like, God, help me not to go off on these people in my job today. And, you know, I'm just thinking about those behaviors. But maybe the bigger lifestyle issue is that, I really do have a struggle with like holding on to bitterness. It's a bigger issue. It's a bigger mindset. It's a bigger thing that sort of surrounds it. That maybe I'm praying about this little thing. God's like, no, if I deal with that little thing, you'll think you're okay. <laughs> and you'll be the most arrogant, bitter person the world has ever known. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not the problem, okay? God delivered me. <laughs> I don't even curse people out anymore. God delivered me. It's like, oh, did he? Right? Because we can focus so much on our favorite symbolic representation of deliverance that we actually don't end up embracing the full thing that God wants to do. You know, it's really funny. Um, Y'all came along at a different time. Y'all really did. Um, the many um, of us did in old school. Once upon a time, you will not believe this. We could measure a person's holiness. We did. We had like holiness meters. And we could measure a person's holiness just like, you know. And, and if you wore red, you remember that? Red, if you wore red, you were not saved. You just were not saved. <laughs> <laughs> and it was so easy to find little external measures to measure people's spirituality by. If you wore shoes and your toes were out, we knew before you even open your mouth to sing, you can't be anointed. Because your toes are out and your heels are out and we knew that you could not be walking with God. And some of the people that wore black and white all the time and that always had their toes covered up, unfortunately, were some of the most evil and not nice and not loving people in the world, because the truth of the matter is that just because we, we pick our own favorite definition of external righteousness does not mean that it really translates to the more meaningful virtues that God is calling us to. Does that make sense to anybody? Um, as we engage with people in ministry, etc., some of you might be surprised um, to find how many people there are that God really is working on, despite the fact that externally they might not look the part that you were expecting them to look. Does that make sense? And people that look like they're doing it and masking it externally, sometimes you actually peel away beyond the superficial surface, you'll find some really, really negative stuff there lurking behind the scenes. I think that all of us have opportunity to ask God, God, change my mindset. It's not just my thoughts. He has to change the way that I think. It's not just um, that my thoughts are not his thoughts. It's that my whole way of thinking is messed up. My thoughts are not your thoughts. 
Revise that. Now, your ways. My ways are not your ways. It's thoughts and ways. All of it just needs to be scratched. I need to look at this thing from a totally different vantage point all together. As I often talk to people about development and growth, right? Um, and the true ministry of people that um, operate in, 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 in fatherhood ministry and apostolic anointing, etc., it should be that when you encounter certain people, they just don't give you new information. They should give you a new way of looking at it. It's a paradigm shift. The whole way that I look at it is to, I didn't see it that way before. From now on, I actually have another angle that I can look at it from. And so, you know, it's good to get information, but it's wonderful to get another perspective that calls you to look at this whole thing totally different altogether. And oftentimes in deliverance, the issue is that you want God to take something away, and what God wants to do is show you something different. Because if you ever see it from his vantage point, the taking away part becomes easier. Does that make sense to anybody? You shall know the truth. Y'all like this scripture, right? And the truth will make you free. Oftentimes, our struggle with bondage is not the struggle of, oh, God, take away. It's the struggle of, there is a truth that I have not yet come to realize or acknowledge yet. It's truth that I'm missing. God, show me truth. Because if God shows me the truth concerning it, then all of a sudden I'm actually able to have victory become easier when I operate in something called truth. I wasn't looking at it the right way. You know, you ever had somebody that you didn't like? Maybe not, y'all. Somebody you didn't like, Khadija, I think that resonates with you quite better. <laughs> <laughs> perhaps a, you know, a, a character on television, Khadija, perhaps, that you didn't like, and as you see this person, um, you're looking at them, and people have talked about a particular, um, actually Netflix series, they said when you first were introduced to this person, you're like, I didn't really like them, but as I began to get more of their background and their backstory, I began to empathize with them, and even though they were still like, they were still a crappy person, but it's like, but I kind of understand, I kind of get it. No, they still have issues, but I'm more understanding of where they're coming from, and if I had to encounter them, I wouldn't be mean back to them, because I kind of understand how they got that way, why they're that way, etc. And so when God tells you to love your enemies, I could just tell you to, you know, be nice to your enemies, right? But at some point, God gives revelation to you Christian people. Oftentimes by God showing you yourself and begin to see how, you know, when, when you get with somebody that you don't like, oftentimes God has this wonderful way of sometimes showing you those exact same traits in yourself. And you're like, man, no, no, but he's different. No, nah, no, nah, but they're different. You don't get it. They're like, well, we might be a little bit similar, but you know, I'm not like him, right? And then, and then you get to like, you become more patient with them. The more you're able to understand them, and your mindset. And now people say something like, "Oh no, you don't understand. You defend your enemy now because you get a whole different mindset. You look at them totally differently. You see them through a whole different lens. You see them through a different." perspective, if you get really, really spiritual, you start to see people like God sees. People are like, oh no, Christ died for this person. I'm going to be careful <laughs> how I treat them. <laughs> God doesn't just tolerate them. He actually loves them. And when you get that revelation, like, wow, God actually loves these people. They're like, I don't see how God could love them. Then you, then you start to realize and recognize yourself. Because I'm convinced before we're saved, we don't really know who we are. And then when we get saved, we start to actually, God starts peeling off layers of ourselves. We're like, Really? I don't know. How did he came with it? No, you were always like that. You just didn't see it. It's like, really? <laughs> right? He begins to show us ourselves. And as we see God loving us through it all, then we're like, oh, I better love them because God has loved me. And that whole vantage point, that whole mindset actually does a work of sanctification in your life. And you actually start loving people, like, for real. Not just like, <laughs> and giving them love. You actually start loving people for real. As your revelation, as your understanding, as your knowledge, as your vantage point begins to shift, but that comes from God allowing God to actually change the way that you think. Um, I've said before, it's not just a matter of changing your thoughts, it's changing the way that you think, because the way that you think 
actually influences how you receive information. Right? So I just don't want different information. I want to be able to receive information differently. Does that make sense to everybody? I just don't want to receive new information. Because if you get new information, but you keep receiving it the same way you've already received it, you're not getting the full benefit of it. And in fact, you can actually cause your mind to explode. In fact, um, the, the, the biblical way of saying that is that the last thing we want to do is take new wine and pour it into old wineskins. If we're going to get new wine, we need God to give us new wineskins. Why does it matter if it's new wineskins or old wineskins? Anybody now? Not because Jesus said so. Because Jesus said so. No! Wrong answer. <laughs> <laughs> That's the, what, what's, the, what, what's the underlying reason why that is? What's unique about wineskins? What's unique about the wine making process? Our kids are 21, like, I don't even know what wine is. It ferments. It, it ferments, which means that it what? It expands. New wineskin, think about skin, right? New wineskin, it actually is able to expand with the process, right? And so as you get air or whatever in there, um, the, the wine the, the, the wine skin can actually expand. However, once it's been used already, it's already gone through the expansion process, has contracted, et cetera, and now it's become more stiff. And it is, so if you put new wine skin in it, new wine in the old wine skin, the old wine skin can then bust, it'll burst. Why? Not because it's bad wine skin. No, it was useful for a time, but it no longer has the ability to expand and contract to respond to the new wine. The most dangerous thing for us in the church is not lack of new information. It's actually how unmalleable we are. It's the fact that we are not willing to contract and to, to contract, wrong to say, contract and expand with new information that God is trying to download to us, our ability and our capacity to receive what God is trying to actually infuse in us. And so God gives us new stuff and we receive it in the same old pattern. And so, therefore, we're not able to fully receive the best that God asked for us because we still keep thinking of it in the same exact way. Does that make sense to anybody? Right? And so, God can give you new money. But if you still have a poverty mindset, you will still make empower have impoverished results. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so, God has to change your mindset and your relationship with how you view finances. Right? And so, he tries to get you... Right? Because tithing is about a new mindset. Don't let nobody confuse you. Right? Because if you think that tithing is just about giving money and not about changing mindset, let one day a bill come be really deep. <laughs> it's going to challenge your tithing decision. Right? But the new mindset with tithing is like, you know, all this money is God's anyway. And God is ultimately the source. Right? You got you to gotta hype yourself up on this stuff first. God is ultimately the source. God will not let me be ashamed for putting my trust in him. And if I trust God with this, God's going to do more with the 90% than I could have done. It's a whole different mindset. If you come with the same defeatist mindset of, I only got limited dollars, got $100, got this to pay, got that to pay, got that to pay. Give God the $10, but I don't know what to do the rest of it. It's like, that, that's not, that mindset's not going to help you. You need the mindset of, oh, no, I know God's got this. This is just money. Here, God, here, take the $10, whatever. You do the, 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 the crazy stuff you do the $9. You, it's not, tithing is not just about your mindset about the 10%. It's actually your mindset about what God can do with the remaining 90%. Does that make sense? It's not just your approach to, to, to 10%. It's your approach to the whole 100%. It's your approach to that 10% and that 90%. It's your whole mindset. Your whole view of money becomes different. Right? In the old world, you, you, you worked hard for your money. right? In the new mindset, it's like no money. It comes from God. God can send it from any direction. Have no idea. In fact, I'm going to give this something from God, and I'm just believing God. It could come from any direction. It could come from the paycheck. It could come from the post office. It could come from anywhere. Some random person walking in and like, hey, million dollars, life changes the situation. The, 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 the possibilities become, in, it become infinite. It expands the realm of possibility. You leave from calculation and result and you begin to transition into faith. 
right? Tithing is all about introducing God into your finances. It's about transitioning from X minus Y equals whatever. It's being like X minus Y, but plus God. <laughs> and at any moment, I would have a plus God. <laughs> And so if you try to take your X minus Y, plus God mindset, and try to bring somebody along that's still in the X minus Y, they will never, ever, ever get it. Because not just about activity. You can't take an X minus Y person, make them a tither, and then get them over here. No, no, no. It's a whole mindset change. It's a whole mindset shift. And don't let you ever get a plus God moment in your life. Because then nobody can't tell you nothing. Well, you see, we hear X minus Y. No, you don't know, okay? I did X minus Y, but there's a plus God. And now, right? You say, you can't make me doubt him. I know too much about him. Once I get my plus God moment, you can't tell me. My, my, I can't even, you can't even go back to the old way of, because that, that's an old mindset. Like, oh, I feel sorry for you. You just got your, your money from your paycheck? That's all you got? How do you live like that? You don't got a favor from God. <laughs> You mean all your bills have, oh, wow, that's really, mm, I don't know how you do that. But when you get that, you just never, go, that mindset is just so explosive to you that it's like, it's just totally, totally different, right? And what God's trying to do is get us to go from old mindsets to faith mindsets. The faith mindset, right? And so we cover a lot of this in relations, right? God's trying to explode our relationships, right? And so old wise can God gives you new relationships, but you keep putting them into the old paradigm. So God gives you a nice, true Christian friend, right? Who will love you unconditionally, but you're still you're still stuck in performance-based religion mindset. Oh, but you know, I said I was gonna meet them at three, but now it's three oh three. They probably hate me now. They'll never be my friend. I should just go back home and just like, and you like that same defeatist mindset. It's performance based. It's like, no, no, they're not looking at performance. They're not trying to, it's that whole notion of you trying to impress somebody. And it's like, no, God's not necessarily impressed with you. It's not about impressing others, but that mindset is dangerous within Christian community. Because it stops us from being effective in Christian community, right? And so what if all of a sudden, uh, Brother Benny was like, you know, yesterday, nobody saw it, but I ate the Skittles. <laughs> I can't read the Bible scripture today. <laughs> but no, he didn't let that stop him. <laughs> but do you know how many people have actually turned their back on God in their Christian walk because of one skittle? And maybe not a skittle, right? But because of one thing that they've allowed to redefine and reconceptualize their walk with God when it was like God was like, I don't even care about the skittles. Don't eat no skittles. I don't even care about the skittles. All right. The picture is so much bigger. We've really got to allow God to really change our mindset. And here's the thing. People that don't have changed mindsets don't understand the concept of changed mindsets. And so all they can do is tell you to do different things. But doing different things without a changed mindset is just slavery. It becomes bondage. Does that make sense to anybody? All you've done is exchange one bondage for another one. Right? It's when your mindset changes. It's when you begin. And that's why in the wisdom of the scriptures, it was essential that at some point we recognize when Paul addresses the Philippian church, I believe it is, no, no, okay. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. 
You've got to get the mindset. And so he tells them about the importance of you know, walking in humility and all that. Because, like, be humble. It's like, we're not getting this, Paul. You know, be not, we're not getting this. He's like, you know what? Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. Like, what do you mean, Paul? You know, though he was in the form of God, so not robbery, though being equal with God, you know, he took on the form of a man. It's like, yeah, that is kind of impressive, isn't it? What makes him do that? He had a totally different mindset, a totally different approach, a different vantage point, a different way of looking at the world. What we need is a different way of looking at it. Right? Walking not by sight, but walking by faith. It's a faith mindset. And the difficulty is that for all of our lives, we are mostly trained to, to interpret life through what we see, through the lens by which we look at things naturally. And God is constantly trying to get us to look at things differently through the lens of faith. It's a totally different Mindset, and so I get these little moral questions that come up every once in a while. Well, Pastor, what do you think about this? What if a man is really, really hungry? No, no, I'll make it better. What if his child is hungry and about to starve? Is it wrong to steal from the store? Right. These old things, right? And so, if my mindset is the mindset of uh, 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 of limited resources, etc that I need to now reframe my values around my, 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 my concept, right? Because my concept informs my values, my way of thinking. But if I have a faith mindset, it's called, no, he just needs to pray and ask God and God will actually supply his need. Now, if you're stuck in your what I see mindset, that's going to totally blow your mind. It's like, what in the world? What kind of ridiculous stuff are you talking about? Until so you do it one time and it works for you, like, oh my gosh, this is crazy. Mm -hmm. But if you're going to be just and righteous, the just shall live by faith. Because if you ever walk outside of faith, at some point, your life is going to present a scenario that will cause you to question your integrity and your sense of righteousness in order to live. Because this world does not play by your rules. So you got to decide which rules am I going to play by. And once you've decided which rules you're going to play by, what you do and what you don't do becomes a lot easier. It's a way of thinking. It's a mindset. So if I enter into the scenario already having a faith mindset, what do I do when I have needs? I go to God. I steal. <laughs> which one? <laughs> Which one, which, one, which one defines how you operate? What's your mindset? It goes so much deeper than just don't steal. No. What's my mindset? If my mindset is that I'm just going, if I don't get this fruit, I'm just, there's no hope. If all of my hope is in the resource and there is no God that sits in heaven that's able to release the resource, then I've got quite the dilemma. But if when I see this, I don't even see lack. It's like, okay, there's bread in the store. Bread in the store? There's bread on, There's bread in heaven. God will send it. It's like totally different mindset. I mean, imagine if Elijah prophesies, right? We're not immune to our own prophecies. Here comes Elijah. There's going to be no rain for three years. Elijah, have you thought about this? You're in the same ecosystem. <laughs> no food for them. No food for you. Like, we don't got no water. I like that. I don't got no water either. What was I thinking? <laughs> what was I? No, but Elijah has a relationship with God, right? And so even if I cause drought for everybody else, <laughs> God's going to take care of me. <laughs> and a widow woman in Zarephath. <laughs> right? right? But it's about your mindset. If your mindset, if you have a drought mindset mentality, and all you think about is resources, etc then you'd be pretty depressed in life, right? You, you, you've got some problems. But if your mindset is that, no, my God shall supply all my need according to, see, that's why we tell you to remember the scriptures, not so you can win a, a, a scripture memorization B, right? Not so you can, like, get some sort of, like, um, prize at the end that you, and, and we, we try to read the scriptures, etc. Not so you can just be, get some sort of prize, like, oh, yeah, I memorized the scripture. No. The hope is that after a while you keep reading this stuff, you meditate on it, 
And it changes not only your thoughts, but changes the way that you think and the way that you see life. I've got to change the way that I approach life. If your mindset isn't right, if you've ever um, done some of these um, mentally gifted type tests, these um, brain teasers, etc., oftentimes it's not about the information, it's about the way that you look at it. Like the stuff like a thousand ways to use a paperclip, right? What they're testing is not did you memorize what a paperclip is used for, right? A thousand ways to remember a paperclip. Uh, I don't understand why you have to wear a thousand ways. Obviously, the textbook definition is for the whole piece of paper together. Right? But when you actually go beyond that and you have a different mindset, you come up with like 10 million different ways to utilize that same sort of paper clip. Right? What is the staff used for? One well, first thing God has to do with Moses is get him to think differently, right? What do we use Moses? What do we use staffs for? To help me walk so I don't trip and fall. God's like, no, wrong answer. Take your staff. Point it towards the water. We split water with staff. All right? That's what you <laughs> Let's try this again. What do we use staffs for? Before then, right? But no, throw it on the ground. Turn it into a serpent. That's right. We create serpents with staffs. <laughs> What's he trying to do? He's trying to blow Moses' whole mind. So that all the limitations that he places upon, he's like, what's in your hand, Moses? It's just this. No, it's not just this. So that you will begin, once your mindset is different, you will look at what's in your hand differently. You'll see potential differently. You'll see reality differently. It's the problem that, um, that, that, that even Gideon has, right? God's like, mighty man of valor. Gideon's like, who? Do you know where I come from? I was like, I'm not interested in your pedigree. He's like, well, I am. Everybody else is, right? It's time to fight, Gideon. It's like, good, this is great. We got a lot of people. God's like, no, no, not with all them, though. Like, what in the world? Right? I felt confident when we had the thousands. Dwindled down to 300, that's not cool. This is not warfare, this is slaughter. I'm setting myself up. Not good. Right? What Gideon has to learn is that, no, no, you don't look based on your resources. You look at God. It's a mindset difference. If God be for us, he's more than the whole world. If every single person on this planet, all of a sudden, all their eyes rolled up to the back of their heads, they all got possessed and were determined to kill every member of GFDM. If God be for us, It's worth more. <laughs> it's more than the whole world. See, I want y'all to get the visual. No, see, the whole world. No, no. All of us, all the cars, they all start turning. Oh, I shouldn't say that. They all start turning. <laughs> That's, you know, cars lined up. People get out their cars like zombies, possessed, coming to get in and, and kill us. We lock the door. They break the glass. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> But God will be more. <laughs> it's a mindset. Right? It's a mindset difference. Right? It's a mindset difference. God is trying to change our mindsets. Let's just change a couple of thoughts here, a couple of thoughts there. Do a little this, do a little this, do a little that. Like, you like that God, right? You saw that? You saw that? I do things a little bit differently now. You know, it's like, it's like, no, no, I want more. I want the whole way that you think to be different. Because you can think different thoughts but still have the same mindset. Right? And if your mindset's not changed, if your way of thinking isn't changed, you will just use new thoughts as a way to still get what your regular mindset wants. Right? And without the change of mindset, it just becomes manipulation. Right? And so there you are. Married to somebody, Vinny, who shall remain nameless, right? You're married. I'm just saying, married, nameless. We don't know who the person is. Right? Married somebody. And they're like, oh, I want this. And you don't really want to do it or whatever. But, you know, you, you just do it or whatever. And it's like, it's really interesting, you know, how you can use those dynamics in order to become manipulative very easily. Right? It's, like, it's, 
If your mindset's not different, like, you never tell me you don't love me, that you love me. Well, I don't. I kind of get on my nerves. But I'm not going to say that. Like, I love you. See, you happy now? <laughs> That's the same way it is with God, though, right? It's like, God's like, I want to be loved. What do you worship? Like, come on, people, give them praise. Like, thank you, Jesus. If they don't stop this part of the service, <laughs> so I can sit down. <laughs> it's very easy just to go through the motions. Right? And just do it because you're being told to do it. And I, my, my fear for most of Christianity is that we're doing this stuff because we're being told to do it. But worship is easy at GFU. I'll tell you why. It's a different mindset. One of, the, one of the easy things that we do when we go out and we minister to different places is when we help them shift mindsets. Right? And so if they've been battered the whole service, like, if you don't pray, you're going to die. It's like, oh, God. It's like, just lift your hands. It's okay. You're in a safe place. <laughs> it doesn't even matter what your volume is. You don't have to scream. Just think about. Pause. Let's intelligently do this. Is there anything you're grateful for God doing for you? You all see that? What should you do? And God, yeah, I eat it. It's different mindset. Now I'm going to beat you up to let you praise him. Right? If we just try to get behaviors without a change in mindset, all we get is superficial demonstration. And here's the thing. We act like God doesn't know the difference. <laughs> Like God can't tell the difference. So God knows the difference. And so God is interested in the changing of your mindset. So remember that as you read your Bible this week, right? It's not just like, man, I don't get like points, like 20,000 Christian points just for reading it. Like, well, he wants a little bit more than just the reading, you know. He kind of wants to get into that mindset. He wants to get into how you think, why you think the way that you do. It's part of what we do in raising young people, right? You, you, you can give them a whole bunch of we'll say, you better not, you better not. Or you give them a mindset, right? Give them a mindset. There's a mindset in my house. It's called, I don't want my house messed up. That's why I don't want to. But you know, if you're going to have a party, make sure the cleaners are careful. The mindset. It's like, I don't want my stuff messed up. It's your mindset. You got to get the mindset. Right? And once you get the mindsets right, you don't have to police every little every little thing because you, you've already impacted the, the, the view of the world. Right? If you get the right world view, right, we don't have to argue and debate over every little thing because you just get it. Right? It's one of the things with the employer, right? You try to get somebody that just gets it. You get somebody working for you, right? You want somebody that just gets it. I don't have to tell you every little thing you do. Right? You work in a daycare, right? Work in the daycare industry, right? I don't want somebody to have to tell them not to kick little children in their teeth. No. <laughs> I don't want to tell you that. I want you to just get it. There's a child care mindset, right? You, you, you don't do that. Y'all laughing. But then there's videos of these caretakers right. doing these terrible things to children. It's like, oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. And you're like, well, was it in the rule book? Was it in the rule book? Who cares if it was in the rule book? <laughs> I shouldn't have to give you a rule that says not to do this to children. Pause, reflect. God shouldn't have to give you a rule. <laughs> well, what does the, does the Bible say I can't do that? <laughs> does the fast like, let me stop. <laughs> One of the reasons I love preachers is that when I preach, I can actually do stuff I can't do any of this stuff. So I almost don't want to stop preaching. <laughs> Ooh, my knees hurt. <laughs> But this makes sense to everybody, the whole mindset thing, and what God really wants, right? And when you begin to realize that God wants mindset, not, then the little stuff we give to God is like, actually, little stuff's like, ooh, ooh, he really wanted this. It's like, oh, yeah, I should, I really want to give God my mindset. <laughs> do I really want to do that? Answer is yes. <laughs> At some point, the answer is yes. Right. The whole thing about Peter walking on water is a mindset thing. If you miss that, you miss the whole point. Right? Peter walks on water, it's a mindset thing. 
but I hear a word, I respond, I obey, I focus on the Lord. But as soon as his mindset goes, he starts looking at other stuff. He's like, and then he saw the winds were coming. Who cares about the wind? God has spoken. He saw the waves. Who cares about the waves? God has spoken. Right? Everybody's scared to shake their heads. It's like, oh, man. <laughs> but how often do you get discouraged and distracted by winds and waves? But honestly, who cares about the winds? Who cares about the waves when God has spoken? Once you get the proper mindset. Okay. We, get the, we get the word, like, oh, I heard the word. I'm going to walk on water. I get the word. It's like, no, the word is not merely walk on water. The word. If I only get a word, say, walk on water, I'm coming. It's like, yeah, you got the word, but because you don't have the right mindset, your word has gotten you in danger. <laughs> You're about to die. That word's going to kill you. <laughs> I saved me, Jesus. Save me, Jesus. I obeyed your word. What <laughs> you got the word, but you had the right mindset. The right word and the wrong mindset becomes suicidal. It's suicide. What's who? Are you okay? Make sure you weren't like suicidal over there. But the right word, the wrong word, the, the, the right, wrong mindset can actually be destructive for you. Makes sense, everybody. We are concluding, I believe. Um, I'm going to ask what? Sister Khadija Thank you. to come and give us our closing prayer. Thank you, Sister Khadija. Brother Vinny already did something.